globalization, global markets, global governance. Okay, this is a very, very big issue for ICT for D that's very, very neglected. Okay, the changes in global governance and what they mean. And again, just the internet.org is a very nice example of that. Okay, where people who are operating in the global um, internet governance world of, of ICANN and um, you know, mythical, completely open systems with no wall gardens and, I don't know, no network, you know, um, adjustments for congestion or whatever happens because there's always, you know, some breaking of the principle of, of net neutrality, um, are having to engage with, you know, mobile companies on the ground who are sometimes smaller entrant companies, so they're actually enhancing competition by entering into these exclusive relationships with these big global monopolies. And they are actually delivering service. So in saying, okay, no, that is terrible, that is a complete you know, negation of net neutrality, it must stop right now, internet.org, India, we're gonna ban, um, you know, internet.org. Um, okay, that's for you who are connected that are saying, you know, what these wall gardens, etc., etc. But the effect of that is gonna keep millions of poor people offline. That is the practical effect of that. So, um, so as I said, I think this, the understanding the potential, it's hard, but the potential of these disruptive um, uh, technologies, these disrupt, the, the disruption that they have on, on social, political, and economic institutions is, is very important to keep in mind because in that is enormous potential. Um, also, just you know, in terms of presenting um, um, ICTs as um, apolitical, um, you know, if we look at the way ICT is being used, particularly around political equality and, and um, in order to assert certain rights, you know, it's often violent. It's um, it's contested. It's very often the people who are contesting or using ICTs are extremely or highly unequal. Um, so we need to understand this. Not as you know, we need to get the gloves off and, and, and engage. Um, and then also to just understand this collision of laws of systems global governance with national governance, internet governance, internet markets, internet um, behavior with national telco, all kind of, you know, um, uh, uh, net, you know uh, network infrastructure kind of behavior. Um, and then, as I said, you know, we have to keep in mind the, the, um, an account for the political economy in each country. What works in one country that's developing will not work necessarily in another country at all. Um, and then, as I said, what we're increasingly seeing with the maturity and the advancement of the internet is this collision of um, a purely technical world um, with the exposure people are getting to issues of, you know, of freedom, of, of rights, and of equality, and that kind of thing. And so governments that you know, created enormous access for people, like the Egyptian government did, for example, you know, always on the ITU, best e-government services, um, you know, things before, before the revolution, um, really connected people, had a young, uh, you know, emerging, educated um, class of people that were also trained there and, and abroad, um, and people were exposed. And so, you know, the opening up of the internet comes with a challenge to repressive governments who are committed to ICTs for development, but not necessarily for political development. And you see this clash. You know, we see it. We see it. For example, one of our great ICT countries in terms of development in, in Africa is Uganda. Okay, they've got a lot of stuff to keep down prices, get services out there. I mean, still people are very poor, and so the problems of delivering those services are a big challenge. But then you face the issue of you know um, uh, LGBT rights, where people can basically you know face at one point the death penalty, now for, um, you know be permanently in jail um, for using the internet. Um, so the real challenge for us, I think, is to operationalize this uh, theory of development, okay? And as I said, this is really what I think uh, Brett is very useful. Um, mainly because he does draw on a kind of political economy thing, but it's very much broad, it's really multidisciplinary and very, very useful. But being an institutional theorist, a political economist, the use of, of new institutional theory um, to specify the principles that govern the current hegemonic um, but changing um, liberal pluralist project. So basically, um, development, as I said, reached this deadlock um, between um, you know, structuralist 
and then near um, uh, um, uh, Washington consensus type, liberal, neoliberal type policies, and then the emerging Washington, post-Washington consensus that we're seeing is really around trying to find um, alternatives, institutional alternatives, process alternatives, alternative agents um, to the, um, as I said, hegemonic liberal um, paradigm. Now, I want to qualify that because um, I think if you look at the struggle since the Enlightenment, anything progressive is actually trying to um, achieve the kind of um, aspirations of, of the Enlightenment, okay? Of equality, of freedom, of social progress, of scientific objectivity. So, and what I'm trying to distinguish is the kind of neoliberal um, modernization project that happened with the Washington Consensus um, with quite deleterious effects. So, for example, the Washington Consensus, you know, really disempowered states um, in order to establish, to grow markets. But, you know, markets don't just, well, they aren't automatically competitive, except especially when we talk about infrastructure. And in order to effect transformation, you need strong states, not necessarily big states, not necessarily unaccountable states, but you need strong states that can create regulatory institutions, that can create programs to get people um, connected, etc. So I'm just wanting to distinguish the intellectual project of the Enlightenment, which I think we all, um, in our different ways, continue to aspire and contribute to in our work, from the practical um, development initiatives by multilateral agencies at particular points in time that have been framed um, as liberal democratic um, value system, etc. And in a sense they were, but their application um, was limited and you know, had certain, certain problems. Sorry, I just wanted to make that point because I think it, it doesn't come out in a lot of the literature and very often with the um, abandonment and discarding of, of, of neoliberalism go all the kind of you know values of of, uh, of the enlightenment, as I said, of, of our own uh, intellectual struggle. And um, so, absolutely critical to assess the, the political, the economic, and social problems that are associated with successful and unsuccessful attempts um, to manage um, emancipatory, emancipatory trans, um, um, institutions in transition. So we need to you know we need to look at what happened in under the Arab Spring countries. Okay, what was the role of ICT? What was the ICT? ICT for D was very strong under uh, um, the pre-revolution government. That was their two, one of their main agenda items was ICT for D. Government, you know, strong government programs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What is, you know, what what happened there? Okay, the availability of ICTs enabled the revolution. Okay. ICTs were also used extensively to crush that revolution, to identify people, to, you know, those social networks were used against people, etc. Um, it's been used now extensively for surveillance and the incarceration of people. So, you know, the ICTs are not good or bad in themselves, it's how they've been used, what, what are they doing. And because it's been emancipatory in one circumstance in history, doesn't make it emancipatory over, over, um, over time, um, or in other conditions. So. I did touch on this, and I've only got a few minutes, so I'm going to quickly um, just see if there's anything else there I want to add. Um, so I think the important thing to consider in, in the methodology, as I said, I think one needs to think about um, in, 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 in terms of the methodologies, the theories, the conceptual frameworks you might be using. If one is drawing from um, develop, liberal democratic um, uh, Practice practices in the field, one would probably land up with some kind of theory or, or framework that draws on the concept of the individual, which is central to to that um, philosophy, theory, etc. Um, and all I'm arguing in terms of this institutional analysis is that to really locate your research and your ICT practice within a development context, it requires some kind of collective framework, a framework that will allow you to um, change institutions, political, social, economic institutions, societies, um, you know, communities, civic organizations, um, etc. Then the other point I've also already made, but I just want to emphasize it once more, um, is that um, the state 
which became so diminished um, under structural adjustment and under the um, neoliberal Washington consensus type of um, uh, modernization um, development practices um, is critical. However, in developing countries, in many developing countries, in many of our um, countries on this continent, we're dealing with very fragile states. So not only have might they have been stripped of any semblance of you know, um, organization of power that they had or size or resources under structural adjustment programs um, and you know, converted into nasty neo-colonial monsters in some cases. In other cases, they just simply don't have capacities, they don't have resources, they don't have what we call the endowments, the, the resources, the human resources, the financial resources, etc., the institutional resources. Um, to deal with a lot of these development issues. And that's where I think one wants to be very pragmatic and unideological about which kind of you know, school of thought you're coming for. And just, and as I said, this is where I really think the reconstruction of development theory can happen. And it ha can happen particularly in ICT for D, because as I said, ICTs underpin this whole globalization, this whole economic and social transformation that we see globally happening. Um, ICTs under, underpin that, okay? It's the um, IP-based networks that have transformed um, the economy and therefore the society um, that we're living in. And so the, the relationships or the interplays between the state, the market, um, civil society, etc., are very fluid. And the potential for these to rather than be hostile to each other, as one would in a kind of regulatory environment with licensees playing infrastructure people and you know, trying to ensure competition, etc., that these might become more complementary relationships. And I think we, we do see this in the public policy um, literature, in the, IC, in the ICT and broadband literature, with you know, public-private interplays around the provisioning of broadband networks, um, the participation of civil society in global governance, in internet governance. It's all very, it's very dynamic. And if we use our old instrumental um, tools to try and understand these and not look afresh at each, each case we go into, we are going to, in my case, use our you know, old traditional telecommunications competition regulation rules and stomp all over internet.org, um, possibly, or you know, do a competition thing and say, okay, well, in South Africa that's being done in Cell C, they don't actually get market share, they're not really competitive. In fact, if we allow this for a period of time, we can um, let people get online. Nobody's actually staying, all well, evidence shows people aren't staying within the walled gardens anyway. They think Facebook's data is 99% actually staying within the walled garden anyway. It's much bigger concerns about what the poor are actually spending their money on once they get out the walled garden, probably. Point of view. But anyway, um, that, that aside, because that opens up another thing, um, one, you know, one, one wants to look at things that, that, that it's so dynamic. Um, the way we analyze it, the way we regulate it, the way we research it, we need to you know, really look at it with a, a fresh eye in each circumstance that looks at it within that particular context. What is happening in South Africa with internet.org, with a a, a marginal player in the market that has the potential to open is not what is happening with internet.org in other parts of Western North Africa where it's actually got in with a dominant player in the market and really closed up the market, etc. So we can't even look within Africa and say, you know, we, we've got that down, we can now work on, on another issue. It's all very, very dynamic and very, very um, integrated. So that's the point on com complex adaptive systems, which hopefully you'll get a chance um, to. Uh, look at at a later stage and then I haven't got time to, 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 to do this um, now but just to take you back then in terms of what we've said to the ICT ecosystem and every 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 point every linkage um, every relationship within here has a development component to it okay so if we understand the ICT ecosystem as you know um, requiring investment in human development in order to get employment and, and an innovation which is going to drive the complexity of the system. Um, you know, this is what we have, these are the kind of things we have to get right from a policy point of view. As I said, this is a much, much bigger challenge. What kind of networks, public, you know, public Wi-Fi, new, you know, ways of getting 
um, access when we, you know, when we are in a mobile environment that, that, that Jonathan was speaking about. What do, you know? What kind of? How do we keep it open so that people can you know get uh, do apps development not only 